Does everybody understand my English or, yeah, is it all right? I'm actually a foreigner in English, which I am told makes it easier to understand my English. I'm Dutch. Um, now, I've been asked to talk about globalization, cities. I have too much energy. I can't sit. I'm just going to be sort of walking a bit. Ooh, that is a strong light. Um, I don't know much about Croatia, and I do not know much about Zagreb. I only hope that um, what I talk about resonates with at least some of the issues that you are concerned about. My second hope is that we can have questions and that I can learn from you. Let me just start talking right away. Um, I understand that globalization is a term that has hit the ground here in Zagreb. I mean, it's something that people talk about, etc. As you know, there are many kinds of globalizations, cultural, economic, ideological, political, technical, etc. As you also know, there are lots of people who love globalization and lots of people who hate globalization. I am uh, someone who has done research for a very long time on this subject, and I think that there are good kinds of globalizations and there are very bad ones. Neoliberal corporate economic globalization has been very destructive. There are now 60 countries in the world, at least, that are poorer than they were 15 years ago. That is bad. And these are all countries where the IMF, the World Bank, and the United States have been very busy. So that is bad. But I think there are also very interesting kinds of globalization. The ascendance of human rights, the notion of transnational communities, activists around the environment, etc., etc., that is bringing people together. You know, the whole movement of NGOs, the, the, there are many interesting ways in which people now feel that they can connect with each other across borders. I want to talk about one particular kind of place, a certain kind of city. Uh, and you will tell me whether Zagreb is that kind of a city. I, I don't know. But this is a kind of city where both the good and the bad forms of globalization come together. Further, because cities are very concrete places, cities make legible some of the key dynamics that constitute globalization and the conflicts that globalization entails. So I, as a researcher, find that the city allows me to understand issues about globalization, which if I just look at global markets in finance or, ne or, or multinational corporations, I would not necessarily understand. Now, one of the things that has happened in the last 15 years is something that one can think of as an irony. It should not have happened. And that is that as global telecommunications has grown, as firms have globalized their uh, operations, as markets have gone global, lo and behold, that what they have needed more and more is a network of places that concentrate very particular kinds of resources. So what you have today with globalization is that while the global, global markets, global firms, the supranational system gains power, national states lose certain types of powers. A third type of place or location has emerged with growing importance. It's a sub-national location. It's cities. Now, each city is different. 
so you can't generalize, that what we have today is a network of about 40 cities, which are the places where the management, the, the, the servicing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, of the global operations of firms and markets is installed. Now, if you think of the discourse around global telecommunications, this should not have happened. The truth of the matter is that with global telecommunications, geography is neutralized. Distance ceases to matter. That's supposedly the story. Well, indeed, it's only half of the story. The other half of the story <coughs> is that the more firms globalize, the more markets globalize, the more complex their functions become, the more uncertain the markets within which they operate become, and hence the more important a whole variety of informal ways of finding out what the hell is going on, that becomes very important. And there is no place like cities to get at this kind of knowledge. So I think it's one of the ironies that with globalization, the global gains in strength, the national loses, but cities emerge as part of a triangle where before you only had two. You had the national state and you had the international system. And cities basically were below the national state. Now you have three actors. Now, the city, these cities that I'm talking about, are also the places where many of the disadvantaged in the world, where many of the immigrants, where many of the internal minorities wind up concentrating. It is often the place where those who have nothing <coughs> can go and find a place. If you go to Bombay, if you go to Rio or Sao Paulo, the homeless, the landless, are likely to be concentrated today in cities. So cities combine the most powerful global actors in one moment, not the whole story, but one moment of their global operations, and they concentrate growing numbers of the most disadvantaged in the world. I mean, the exception here would be refugees in, in Africa, et cetera, which, you know, they are sort of everywhere. This means that the city becomes a strategic space for global capital, the last place for certain types of disadvantaged and for minorities, and in that sense, a new frontier. In my reading of the world today, the frontier is no longer the Wild West you know, or the colonial edges in Africa or in Asia as it was in the 1800s. The new frontier today is deep inside London, Paris, New York, Los Angeles, Berlin, Amsterdam. It's probably also in Moscow. It is in Bombay. It is in Sao Paulo. So the city is a very interesting kind of place today. It has a lot of good things, and it has a lot of bad things. And so we have to sort of rethink what the meaning of the city is. Now let me make two comments, since you, some of you at least may be wondering, well, you know, in Zagreb, I don't see any of this happening. Again, I don't know. I just, you know, I just don't know. I'm just a foreigner here. But in many cities, this started to become very evident and very sort of a sharp presence already in the mid-1980s. In New York, in London, this was very clear. In other cities, it took a much longer time. In Stockholm, in Dublin, in you know, a whole bunch of European cities, it only starts in the 90s, in the early 90s. I don't know if this is something that many other cities will also go through. The second point I want to make, so one point is that different temporal frames 
for different places of the world. Much earlier in the big cities of the United States. As you know, the United States is a very brutal place. It is, I always like to say that the United States influence on the world is an uncivilizing influence. It's a brutalizing. Um, so in the United States, things often happen sooner. The barbarism, if you want, happens sooner. The brutality of life, the brutality of economic systems happens sooner, in a way, because there is no intermediation there. So the point here is that some cities may get to that, and some may not. But it does not mean that if it isn't there now, that it may not happen in the near future. The second point, I think, is that the crucial actors, the strategic agents that I'm describing, are going to be different in different cities. In the case of New York, it is American global firms and foreign global firms on the one hand. And on the other, it is foreign immigrants and native minorities, especially black Americans, African Americans. In France, in Paris, it is different. It is Parisian, especially global firms, French global firms, and it is Maghrebien, immigrants from Northern Africa, especially, who are the minoritized people. So different, and I don't know what it would be in your city. Your city to me looks incredibly civilized. I just arrived today. It looks, you know, beautiful. I saw the old part there. Beautiful, great. I see no problems, you know, but I'm sure that you have a few problems. Uh, in some places, the conflict might well be one of economic actors, new economic actors who can come in and buy up all kinds of things that one might have thought in the past could not be bought up, and today can be bought up, uh, and then increasingly impoverished sectors of the population who once felt that they were part of a society and now may feel more partially uh, included. And then the third point here is that I am dramatizing a scenario. It doesn't mean that there are in vast middle sectors that are also in there. There are. But I'm just, I don't know if any of you has read Lefebvre, for instance. This is sort of a fairly difficult reading, but some of you may have read him. He was looking at cities in France uh, in the 50s, in the 60s, when the organized working class was the key agent shaping the urban landscape. For me, today, looking at New York, looking at Paris, looking at Berlin, looking at Sao Paulo, the agents shaping the urban landscape are different. It is no longer the organized working class. It is this global corporate actor, and it is this increasing presence of disadvantaged sectors. In other words, they are the new agents. They are not the only presences in the city, but they have the power to reshape a significant part of the urban landscape. So the, Im the irony is, of course, also that very poor, low-income immigrants, poor African Americans, can shape, can inscribe the visible urban landscape. And that is, I think, part of the story so that how the city is experienced, how it gets rebuilt, how it gets renovated, is really one of the issues that I'm talking about. Now, I want to, to, uh, to bring in a couple of issues around political uh, aspects. Under globalization, as the national state loses authority, and again, in your case, you are a fairly young national state in your new incarnation. I don't know if you have been able to experience this, but you can look at the European countries, you can look at, at uh, the Latin American governments, etc., the African. They lose authorities through privatization, through deregulation, the whole variety of issues that have to do with globalization. 
And as this happens, there are sort of blanks that emerge. We can call them institutional openings, whatever. I don't want to, to make it too difficult here in terms of the language. But the crucial point is that informal political actors can find room, if you want, place to execute their oper I heard it, <laughs> to execute their operations. And there is no, for instance, the world of NGOs, right? In the last 10 years, with the growing power of global actors and the declining power of national states, NGOs have become far more important, far more visible. I think you're all familiar with this. But if you look at the space of the city, you can sort of elaborate this further and, for instance, see that in the space of the city, a whole variety of informal, what I like to think of as informal political actors, can also emerge. Now, let me take you to the cities that I'm familiar with. Um, in a city like New York, or in a city like Paris, or Berlin, or Amsterdam, or London, you can be an illegal immigrant, you know, what we call undocumented or unauthorized immigrant, and you can participate in street-level politics, right? You can engage in demonstrations against police brutality, you can engage in anti-gentrification struggles, you know, all kinds of things. I think the term gentrification is familiar here, right? Yes, is it or not? Yeah, yeah, okay, fine, so you know what I mean. Um, you don't have to be a citizen. You can engage in politics that have to do, let's say, with politics of sexuality, politics of, around questions of culture and art, all kinds of things that you could not engage in if you're thinking of the national political system. In the national political system, number one, you've got to be a citizen, formally speaking, a citizen. Number two, you're confined. You can either vote, which is very powerful, but it's a very formal system. Or you can take your government to court, you know, sue your government. Now, I don't know if you have that right here in Croatia. We in the United States do, and we have made a national sport out of taking our government to court. Now, in Europe, more and more countries have now constitutionalized that right. So the French can take their government to court, the Germans can take their government to court, the Dutch, etc. They are beginning to do that. And frankly, in the United States, I of course think, especially given today's <laughs> issues, we should do much more of it. But anyhow, these are very powerful instruments. We as citizens have enormous powers. We don't always use those powers, we don't execute them well, we don't do our homework to know what the issues are, but we have those powers. Think of the space of the city. The space of the city is a very concrete space for politics. It can accommodate all kinds of informal politics. Um, you know, all the issues that I mentioned against police brutality, against gentrification, against this or that, factory or employer who's thinking of leaving. I mean, enormous. The, the politics of gay, lesbians, and queers, the whatever it might be, all kinds of things. So the space of the city, especially today, when it is also the space where the strategic agents find themselves both present and are reshaping the urban landscape, the space of the city is also the space where new kinds of politics can be constructed. And given this triangulation that is part of globalization, where you have the national state, the global level, and then cities, and especially networked cities, this is actually a very interesting proposition. Now, I want to take you back to an earlier period which is the period you know, of the Middle Ages, of the Renaissance, etc., when you didn't have the kind of system that we have today where the world is divided into national states, and where the space of the city 
was a deeply political space. And some of you, I'm sure, have read Max Weber. You know Max Weber? Um, and his, he, he adored the medieval European cities. He was not interested in medieval Russian cities. He just wanted the medieval European cities. And what he saw there, and let me just, you know, I'll just remind your memory here. <laughs> um, he was observing the burghers. I mean, not he, he was, you know, thinking about those burghers. Now, those burghers, those urban residents, were engaged in practices. Often, I think, fairly mindless practices, actually. The practices that they were engaged in were practices that were aimed at securing the right to protect their property from you know, all kinds of despots, big and small, around them. The church, the king, the lords, etc., etc. Through those practices, they, those burghers were not thinking citizenship. But through those practices, which were deeply grounded in very real, immediate issues that were right there <coughs> in the city, the city was the space where the burghers thought they could protect their properties. If they were out in the fields, forget it. There were the lords and the king and the church. No way. Now, out of those practices, those material practices, came something that eventually became citizenship, modern citizenship. So I now stand back and I look at these cities. And I look at these cities as these places for informal politics, as well as formal politics. Places that make possible the emergence of new types of political actors. You know, actually, we don't even know what they are. Where you can be even an unauthorized immigrant and be a political actor. And <clears throat> if you take this seriously, I mean, you look around the world, and you have all kinds of street-level politics happening. It's not new either. What is different today is the charged meaning of the space of the city, precisely because it is both the place where global economic actors, the most powerful actors in the world today, find one site for their strategic operations and the place where these masses of disadvantaged can also find a site for their operations. In that context, the notion of the place of the city as a place for inventing new forms of politics, new kinds of practices that can become political and that eventually might lead to formalizations. Now, here, let, let me just illustrate with one particular example, the anti-globalization movement, which, of course, is a global movement. Right. My favorite sign is still the sign in Seattle, big sign on the anti-globalization people, worldwide coalition against globalization. That makes it rather clear, right? And in fact, in Porto Alegre, I don't know if people know about Porto Alegre, like some of you must know, right? The, anti, the World Social Forum, I was there last year. The notion now is, the effort is globalizing resistance. Now, the material practices of this movement since Seattle, where what? You went to the mostly cities, actually, where the IMF or the World Bank or the WTO were meeting. Formally speaking, the subject, the actor, that is this anti-globalization activist is a tourist. Most of these people, when they went from one city to the other, if they had to get a visa, it was as a tourist. Right? That was the formal status. But they used the space of those cities to do what? To do citizens' work. Because most of them were really about that. They are really about doing citizens' work, demanding accountability from global corporations, demanding social justice, demanding distributive, etc., etc. So form the formal actor is the tourist, the actual political actor, is something very different, is a citizen who feels entitled to go to another city in another country where she is not a citizen of and do her 
citizen work. Now, this to me is an interesting kind of globalization, by the way. But it also signals this possibility of informal politics in the space of the city, of informal political actors. Now, I know that the term, I'm making a footnote here, I know that the term informal often here means, um, you know, like an informal economy, shadow economy, etc. I'm not necessarily thinking about that. These are not shadow actors. These are informal actors. You know, they are not formalized. Now, another feature about globalization and cities is that more and more of the transactions that we call global actually take place between cities. Either because cities are where the big harbors are, this is land trade, because cities are where the big financial and business centers are, so that's for everything else, for investment, for global finance, etc. And if you then also look at the map of immigrant distribution, you see that most immigrants in Europe, in North America, are disproportionately concentrated in the cities. Then you begin to get a sense of the global as constructed through very specific circuits. For this particular financial issue, for this particular trade component, for this particular immigrant group, etc., etc. And you multiply it, and you multiply it, many, many immigrant groups, many different types of trading circuits, many different types of financial circuits, many different types of artistic circuits. The art market includes places like, you know, Cologne, New York, Paris, that the Biennale circuit does not. That's a very different kind of circuit, right? So then you begin to get a sense of the global as constituted through multiple very particular circuits that connect very specific types of places, and they're mostly cities. And so suddenly you stand back and you look at globalization, and you begin to understand it, not just as a series of very threatening conditions, these big multinationals, markets, etc. I can talk about that a lot. I do a lot of research on global finance and on multinational corporations. But you also begin to see it as a set of other circuits and actors, which are enabled by the fact itself that the national state is partly destabilized. Because national states are also very formalized concentrations of power, which have always contained exclusions. They have included, and at their best, often with social democracies, they have maximized inclusion, but they've always excluded. And they've always produced privilege and formalized that privilege. And so then you begin to look at globalization in today's era, and you begin to also see that there are these possibilities. They are emergent. They are not accomplished. They are not done. They are emergent, but they are there. Now, I want to move to an issue that connects to the fact, what I just finished saying, they are emergent. There is work to be done. So we have these informal politics. We have these places where people are enabled. But that doesn't mean that a better world can happen. And here I want to focus on one very particular issue because I gather that it is also an issue in your country. And that is this whole question of the making of law. Right? You, I don't know if this is, um, maybe I should elaborate a bit, but as we sit here, you mostly doing nothing, sitting there, you know, hearing me, me sort of chattering here, um, law is being made all over the world, around internet governance, around WTO, around, you name it, copyright, law is being made. <coughs> and it seems to me that one of the main battlefields where all this informal political energy and capability should be focused on is to resist 
to examine, to subject to public scrutiny, all this lawmaking. Because the truth of the matter is that that triangulation that I described, where the national state loses authority, the global level gains authority. And then you have this third site, which is an you know, unfinished product, this new frontier, the city, that all of this has meant that there is a whole task of reformalizing structures of legitimacy. And one of these structures of legitimacy, just to mention something that I'm sure you are familiar with, is this whole question of copywriting, right? Everybody must have heard of that. I mean, there are many others, like the way we're setting up law to govern the internet. You know, it's very disturbing, by the way, very, very disturbing. But that's m often more difficult to understand. But copyright, you've all heard this. I mean, the most extreme case I'm sure you've heard is this notion of, um, um, of copywriting seeds, right? You buy the plant, right? And you cannot use the seed, right? You, I mean, you have the seed, you grow the plant, and then you cannot use the seed. You know about this, right? <coughs> this is the extreme. So farmers buy seeds, they plant, they harvest, and then they cannot use the seeds of their own plants because they have been copyrighted. This is the most extreme instance, but there are other such. This is just a very legible one. Now, this copywriting is happening in many different ways. I want to take you to Times Square. You know about Times Square, right? Times Square in New York used to be the most public square in New York. That's where masses of people came. Everything was there, from the highest to the lowliest. Everything. Now Times Square has been cleaned up and bought up. When I walk through Times Square, all I see is copyright, private property, private property. Now, I understand that you are experiencing some of that <laughs> here in both, I don't know if in Zagreb, but certainly in Croatia, the buying up, that things become private. So when I say private property and copywriting, I mean it in multiple levels. Now, the issue that, the, that is at the heart for me of this, see if I can communicate, um, uh, I'm trying to make myself understood because I know that English is not your main language. Uh, when I spoke about the burgers, Weber's, Max Weber's burgers, engaging in practices that had the object of protecting, having the right to protect their properties, right? I think that today we're in a period of transition. A lot of stuff is somewhat informal. National states have withdrawn some of their participation from the national economy, national culture, national eco all kinds of things. The global system is in formation. WTO passes new laws, IMF passes new regulations, etc., etc. And there is a lot of stuff happening that has not been subjected yet to formalization. But the push of this system is to formalize. And one way of formalizing is to make law. Now, I, I need one minute on law here, because the space of the city is that space where the law always runs into trouble. Because it is a bit messy, a bit anarchic, because it is so concrete, so rich, so much mixity. So think here of the space of the city as this new frontier zone that I'm talking about. Now think of law. We tend to think that law is good, right? Law is. But legal architectures are systems that freeze privilege, rights, exclusions, inclusions. And often the law, a legal system, reflects the advantages of a certain sector and makes them legitimate. In the United States, we believe in private property. You know that, right? Mind you, the French also believe in private property. So do the Germans. If you compare 
the legal system in the United States for the protection of private property with the legal system in France and in Germany, you see a very interesting difference. And that is that in France, the wall that is built, or in Germany, it's more or less the same, to protect private property, let's say, is about this thick. In the United States, it's about this <coughs> thick. In other words, you have the right to kill somebody if you think they are invading your house. You do not have that right in France. So the way we protect something that we may all believe in can vary enormously. What is happening today is that very powerful actors are producing law that is an enormously skewed, you know what I mean, distorted protection of certain rights. Now, it reminds me, there's this famous story of a dictator in Latin America, this is about the law, who said, for my friends, everything. For my enemies, the law. In other words, the law is not just something that, that is good. The law has to be subjected to very critical examination. Now, in a country like yours, which has just been, you've done a new constitution, you have done, you know, these are very strategic moments in your history. Thinking of your city, which also comes out of that period of transition, how you, how you say, organize the rights, the, the rightful claims to land, who can occupy, who can buy what land, what part of your land, which used to be maybe in the public domain, can now be made private. You know, these are all issues that are enormously important and that will make a lot of difference in how sort of this, the common good, the social good, is produced, is ensured, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I want to come back to this image. Powerful system operating in a context where the national state, the main actor in charge of the law and of producing law, withdraws a bit, and hence this supranational system where the key actors represent a very narrow spectrum of objectives is in charge. The only other site where you have some political potential, something that can be yet another actor, is the space of the city. Because this is a frontier zone, and it is a time of enormous transitions. And in that sense, I want to also come back again to Max Weber and say that here are these practices by the urban residents, right, the burghers. They have very clear objectives. They have to do with protecting certain rights, etc., their rights. But in fact, they became the beginning of a much more complex history. Now, it seems to me that today also, we need to take the city and what happens in the space of the city very, very seriously. And to do so in two ways. One way, because a lot of stuff today plays out in the space of the city. And the global city, of which there are about 40 in the world, is the most extreme case of that. This is where big battles are happening. They don't happen always on the street, by the way, you know, but these, these conflicts. And think again, because you have these two crucial actors, one globally enabled, very powerful, with a very narrow agenda, and the other an amalgamated mix of disadvantaged people who are, in fact, becoming more and more disadvantaged in many, many cases. But if you have a multitude of disadvantaged people, that creates its own project. And by disadvantaged, I don't only mean the most disadvantaged, like homeless people. I mean all kinds of people who are losing. The middle classes in London, in New York, in Los Angeles, in Paris, in Amsterdam, they're all losing. Some of them are getting very rich, but most of them are losing ground. I don't know what it is like in Zagreb, whether your middle classes have lost or not. I know that in quite a few of the cities, of the former sort of socialist bloc, 
part of the middle class has lost, has lost certain rights, has lost certain entitlements, etc. Anyhow, a multitude of disadvantaged people concentrated in a certain kind of place where the most powerful actors are also concentrated, this is interesting, <laughs> politically speaking, right? But the second reason I think we should take our city seriously is because they are microcosms, they are lenses, and they sort of make legible what is happening. And in that sense, we can understand something. I've understood a lot about what globalization is about, the good, the bad, the possibilities, the, the, the impossible, you know, what can no longer be changed, etc., by looking at, at cities, certain kinds of cities, certainly. You know, I'm not saying that all cities are this way. It's a minority of cities, frankly. Uh, I have to, I realize, I just talk. I need to know what, how, how much, should I go on? Another two minutes? Am I at the end there? Yeah. Um, so there was, there was a time not too long ago, and you can see it in the statistics, when cities had lost a lot of ground. You looked again at Paris, you looked at London, they lost share in the national economy, they lost share of wealth, they were not strategic. The strategic spaces in these national economies were two. The mass manufactured, you know, the factory, the big factory, and the government. Why? Because whether it was the United States or whether it was the UK or France or, in fact, some more centrally planned economies, the government played a crucial role. So the strategic spaces were those two, the big factory and the government. And a lot of the struggles played out there. And cities, I mean, cities are there, but they're not strategic. They're sort of root routinized servicing or retail, whatever. And what happens in the last 15 years is this repositioning of the city. So I, I am very keen on not, as we might say, naturalizing the city. The city is not always strategic. Cities were strategic, you know, in the Hanseatic League. They were strategic when Venice and Amsterdam, etc. But for a good part of the history of the last 100 years, Cities have not been strategic. So what happens today is precisely because the national loses, because the, the global ascends, you have this triangulation, and cities reemerge as strategic. Now, I if I were living in Zagreb, I would be very interested in trying to understand you know, how some of these transformations play in a city like this. I understand that, y to a very large extent, you have lost much of your industry, you're more a center of consumption and retail than you are for making, for instance, you know, etc. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know enough. I wouldn't dare to say anything, but I would be interested, and I hope that tomorrow I'll learn a bit more, in understanding how some of these dynamics play. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a city like Dublin only got into this sort of cycle, into this phase, if you want, in the early 1990s, and then it did with a vengeance. Um, so, you know, there are different temporal frames. When I speak about these 40 global cities in the world that are, if you want, they, they are the organizational architecture for the global economic system. So, the political project for me there also, is I do a lot of work with mayors, is if the mayors <laughs> of these cities, you know, the urban leadership, both the mayors and the civic leadership, you know, all kinds of leadership. If they could get together and internationalize their work, you know, they would have a lot of power. And the, the key issue that comes out of that is the extent to which global corporate capital, which is mostly financial capital, that is to say dematerialized, operating in electronic markets, needs to implant itself in a network of places. Now, I've done a lot of work on that issue. I don't want to, to dwell too much on that, but that is a crucial part of, if you want, this organizational architecture. That means that this network of cities is, as I said earlier, a space of power. And then, I repeat now, 
if that network of cities is also a place where mixes of people from many different countries, the most internationalized groupings of both the powerful and the disadvantaged, the poor, come together there. You know that in New York City, in the, in the restaurant, you know, the, at the World Trade Center, there were 60 nationalities among the restaurant staff. You know that restaurant on top, Windows on the World, it was called? I don't know if any of you have heard it. Anyway, that was one restaurant. It was a very big restaurant. But the staff had 60 nationalities. A city like New York has over 125 different nationalities among immigrants who are basically, many of them, low income. So what comes together in, in, in these cities... Now, the cities in the global north are far more internationalized than the cities in the global south, mind you. But what comes together in these cities is a lot of little bits of the world. So this network of 40 global cities is a microcosm of the globe, also in terms of these disadvantaged. Um, I think I'm going to conclude. What I would really like is to hear some questions. I hope you have questions, and I would like to hear some comments. And I can only hope that what I try to, to talk about here, that I manage to communicate something about this. I mean, it's a view, I'm clearly theorizing it. I'm rhetoricizing the issues, if you want, right? Because there are, each of these cities contains many other things. But to theorize, in a way, also means to see something, like for the old Greeks, theoria, seeing, that is not necessarily completely self-evident. So what I am seeing are these strategic agents and this notion of a new frontier zone, this possibility of new types of politics in a context where the national system loses some of these possibilities. So in that sense, it is, if you want, a theorizing about the space of the city. But it is a theorizing that is grounded in some very thick empirical conditions. And, um, and again, I just, I just hope that I managed to communicate. Thank you very, very much for your attention. I'll just, um, yes. <laughs> to me, it was uh, quite interesting uh, when you uh, spoke about this the network of new global centers. It seems that the class of the leftover people, places, and cities that you mentioned is somehow happening here because. Although we all hope that maybe Zagreb could be uh, some of the southeastern Europe uh, uh, regional center, I think perhaps Budapest has taken over the place. Uh, uh, I think that there are people here that are particularly interested in in the notion of um, when you mentioned NGOs and so the the uh, the possibility of. Uh, the city as a place where the non-formal or non-political uh, powers could could practice their uh, will and uh, projects. Uh, anyway, I would like to maybe to to, to draw discussion to uh, the maybe my particular interest. Uh, maybe you can tell us something of how this uh, global state that cities are entering in maybe changes its topography and. Since I know that you are um, uh, that you know Budapest a lot, maybe you can tell us something what happened since it is an Eastern country. They passed our tradition as we are right. now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you said a whole bunch of things, but let me start with Budapest since that is uh, a familiar place, probably. Uh, I mean, the way I'd like to start this is by saying that there was a whole bunch. Once upon a time, <laughs> there was a whole bunch of big North American firms who decided, after 1989, that they were going to try out the markets of Central Europe. And um, 
some of us sitting there, you know, taking, making bets, as we would say. Um, oh, this light is meant to shine on me. I was trying to avoid it all the time, but it's meant. Okay, very good. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, so we were making bets, you know, back then. And we were saying, well, I bet you they're going to use Vienna, Vienna as a base. And they went to Budapest. And it's also interesting to hear what firms they were. They were very much into consumer markets, especially the big um, cosmetics firms like Revlon and I don't know what, you know. And, and they used, and here's the story that I want to tell. Their, their objective was the whole Central European market. And they used one city. Now, we're talking about really the 80s and the early 90s. I mean, especially the early 90s is when this begins, right? They used Budapest as their base to enter the Central European, the Central European region. And so, I don't know, I'm sure that many of you have been in Budapest. Budapest literally developed a glamour zone, you know, which, and it's, it's a mix of the presence of these firms and the presence of the high income professionals and then all kinds of other things that agglutinate if you want around it. But I also thought, I mean, there is a way in which a geography, the geometry of a geography gets constructed. In this case, the geography we're talking about is the geography of the market for these global firms. The geometry of this geography had Budapest as its central point. And Berlin eventually emerges as the other city that also sort of has a shadow effect, if you want. But Budapest really is the key city. Now, Budapest is, of course, part of Hungary. And as you know, Hungary has been deregulating its economy. You know, it started in the 80s. It had the aspiration of setting up, being the leading financial center in Central Europe. So it already had a very conscious project in that direction. Um, and th the second question I hear in Marco's comment is, OK, so you have Budapest out there, you know, way ahead of all the other places in Central Europe. Once that happens, how many other cities can assume that role? And I think there is a phenomenon today in the world, if I look at this, which is as follows. On the one hand, a growing incorporation of more and more cities around the world. Sao Paulo is part of it, Buenos Aires, I mean, now crises, et cetera. Bombay, you know, uh, 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 Taipei, Manila, Jakarta. They just, they keep on adding. So a, glo a growing global network. On the other hand, when you go inside particular regions and countries, the downgrading of a lot of other cities and the ascendance of one city. What always struck me was the case of Canada and Australia. These are two advanced economies, right? They are huge. I mean, they are huge countries. They used to have two or three big cities. In the case of, of Australia, Melbourne and Sydney, you know, were absolutely the two dominant cities. And in Canada, Toronto and Montreal. What you begin to see in the 90s is that one of these cities gains, concentrates more and more. In Australia, Sydney. Instead of not only those two cities growing more, both, but in fact, there is room for three or five other cities in such a big country, right? Same thing in Canada. You would have expected five, six major cities if you have an era of enormous prosperity, production of wealth, new technology, you know, connectivity. And instead what happens is that within countries, one city ascends. Look at Switzerland. Switzerland used to have several major financial centers. Well, Zurich ascended and left the others behind. Frankfurt in Germany. There was a time when the other six regional financial centers distributed with Frankfurt, you know, more or less the same. Frankfurt in the 90s jumps up and leaves the others behind. So the geometry of the geography is global in 
growth of the network, more and more cities of more and more countries, but within each country, one city disproportionate concentration. Now we're talking about certain particular activities. When I then come back to Budapest in Central Europe, the question I have is a question of scale. Now for some of you, questions of scale might be profoundly boring. I understand that, all right? But actually scale is a very exciting, believe me, all right? Believe it. It's a very exciting uh, uh, condition or, or you know, analytic variable. Let's put it that way. Uh, and here's the question. The question is whether the scaling has grown enormously so that you have a huge country like Canada, which is also a huge economic system, or Australia, and there is room for one major. The question is whether Central Europe, a good part of Central Europe, in view of this question of scaling, begins to constitute itself as a region. Partly, if you, if you remember, the European Union is also a question of scaling. Because I think that in the last five years, the programmatics of the European Union have been very strongly pushed by big corporate economic interests. The euro happened as quickly as it happened because there were very powerful corporations who really wanted a bigger scale for European uh, uh, firms. There were other reasons, but it, went, it happened so quickly that had something to do. There were vested interests. And when you look at how the labor unions in Germany, in France, in everywhere complain about what has happened, you know, the price of everything is higher. You don't have the euro yet, right? No, but you may. Anyway, every, the, the, the ordinary person is paying more in all these countries through the euro. This is now a well-established fact. So, you know, so this question of scale is actually a real issue. So, yes, Budapest as a key base, and then perhaps, you know, that is an issue of scale. Now, you were part of something that was once called Yugoslavia. You had a different scale in terms of markets, etc. I don't know if in the end you federate, you know, you re-federate at some level. These are all very complex issues. I don't have an answer to them, but I do think that part of the answer has to do with these issues of scaling. Now, you also talked about NGOs, and I think that the question of uh, NGOs and the spaces, the political geographies for NGOs, you know, that is yet another story, but clearly the NGOs can now go global. You can be a very poor NGO and be part of global networks, partly because of the internet, which is fantastic. Anyhow, let me hear some... Um, Nobody, you don't ask questions here? <laughs> yes. I learned through your questions. <laughs> uh, it was interesting uh, how you put this kind of uh, globalization uh, issue and uh, n uh, cities and, as a nodes in the network. Mm -hmm. And what I'm interested in, in uh, is this, let's say, uh, very specific event happened uh, a year ago or a bit more. It's this September 11th. Yes. Uh, and it affected actually uh, the uh, total global system of the cities, of the economy, yep. of everything. Yep. So it raised uh, uh, one issue which is very visible. It's a security issue, which is showing actually that this global system of, uh, let's say, cities, it's very vulnerable, actually. Yep. It's, it's, it's yep. uh, in one hand, is a stable, kind of globalization, uh, big uh, multinationals, etc. But uh, through this e uh, event, it is obvious that it's in the same way uh, also unstable, very unstable system. So uh, my question would be, uh, what are, in your opinion, uh, the issues as security is raised yeah. at the moment, which could uh, uh, become more important issues in uh, let's say, uh, future, considering this kind of globalization right. or something. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 absolutely. And I, I brought some copies of an article focused on New York after September 11th and what that means, and I will be happy. It's in French, though. The French asked me to write this. Uh, 
that I will be happy to leave here with the organizers, which has a lot of detail in terms of answering. Now let me start answering your question by, by describing the following um, fact. The United States Department of State had produced a data set in the year 2000, going through the whole 90s, from 1990 to 2000, showing that major cities like New York, Paris, and London are becoming primary targets for international terrorism. Now, this is 2000, okay? And this feeds into the whole thing right now, you know, the big debate that the CIA was asleep <laughs> because all the study had all the evidence, and, and the State Department had all of this information. And secondly, they show that from 1998 onwards, most ter international terrorism affects cities. It used to be that it was planes, right, hijacked planes. It begins to be cities. So clearly something happened already before September 201 that makes out of cities primary targets. Now the enemy is not the city. It's just that the city is a concentrated communication event. You hit a city, you have produced a global media event. So I think that what begins to... And, and this is another way of, of talking about this ascendant role of cities. You know, cities capture the imaginaries. I mean, I, go, I, lock, I talk to a lot of literary people who are all obsessed with cities now, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So there is something happening, and these kinds of attacks that already happened before September 11 already signal how important the city is as, a, as an act of communication. It becomes an iconic object. So, so much on that. You know, th that has its own importance. Because, again, the enemy was not New York City for this attack. The enemy was the corporate, economic, and military power of the United States. But hitting the World Trade Center, which, moreover, belongs to the 60s, it has nothing to do with contemporary global finance, uh, very little, actually. Uh, now, second on the security issues that you mentioned. I mean... I have long been amazed at how this system, which has these enormous concentrations of capabilities in a few, in a limited number of places, is so vulnerable to all kinds of things. You know, there are they could the the disruption of the infrastructure for telecommunications, for instance. You know, you hit <laughs> that and you have stopped financial markets. Now, I want to mention one thing that. I found very interesting. So the attacks happen. They destroy mostly uh, 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 workspaces that have to, little to do with finance, mind you. But they hit the infrastructure for telecommunications. They succeed in stopping the functioning of the New York exchanges. Okay, There are six of them. Well, the best known is the New York stock market. There are others, right? They stop for four days, right? That's nothing, right? Four days is nothing. But guess what? A third of the value is lost of the stock market valuation. Ten trillion dollars, something like that. Now, why? It is not like the ten trillion dollars were sitting there in the World Trade Center and they were all burnt and they disappeared. No, it's not. It was all, it's all electronic. So my question has been, what is it that causes this debacle in the global financial market? Because London is hit, etc. Why? What is it? We're dealing with, fin it's mostly finance that got hit, right? We're dealing with fi a financial, an industry which deals with electronic markets and dematerialized goods. Why should the bombing of the World Trade Center affect it the way it did? because it was a cataclysmic event for global finance, and it still has not recovered. Though it is recovering, by the way, faster always than I expect it to do. I mean, I'm always ready for the financial system to collapse, and it just doesn't. It reinvents itself. You know, it keeps on going. Anyway. But here is my definition of global finance. Global finance, number one, is not about money. Mostly it is not about money the way you and I know money. Secondly, a 
according to some estimates by colleagues of mine at the University of Chicago, and you know the University of Chicago is a very conservative university, so we're not talking about radical you know, economists who come out, no. But only about 30% of the money that is raised on Wall Street goes for what finance was originally meant to, which was as a factor for investment, for production, for development, etc. I mean, we all need a bit of finance, you know. But 70% of what is called finance on Wall Street has nothing to do with that. What is it? What it is, I have this definition. It is man it's managed money-making transactivity. The fact that it operates in electronic markets, the fact that it is a digitized event, right, means that you can multiply the transactions. And every transaction, every time you buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell, you make money. What got hit on September 11th in, Wa in Wall Street was the capacity to manage that transactivity. And New York is so important. I mean, it is an enormous. The, the, just to give you a sense, the global stock market valuation in 2001, before September 11, was 30 trillion dollars. Okay, that's a lot of do a lot of zeros, mind you. Uh, 20 trillion was New York. So you know, it's like an elephant. In a porcelain shop, doesn't begin to capture what this is. This is huge. But what got hit was not that the money, was the, those 20 trillion were somehow, no. It was the capacity to manage. So the question in terms of security is, can that capability, for me the global city, when I look at the economic parts of the global city, is a capability. It's not about headquarters. I, it just irritates the hell out of me when people count headquarters and think that they're getting nothing to do with headquarters. Well, it has something to do with headquarters. But it is a capability, which can be very specialized. You know, if you are Hollywood, your capability is very different from Wall Street. So what really happened September 11th is that part of this capability got destroyed. The question then is, in terms of your security question, can this capability be produced under, under a, a situation of less spatial concentration. Right now, the utility of spatial agglomeration is this incredible mixity of talents and resources and the, the creativity that comes with that. That is Hollywood, that is Silicon Valley, and Wall Street or the city of London are the Silicon Valleys of finance. You know. Can that capability, which takes enormous creativity, be produced under conditions of less spatial agglomeration. And I think that the next phase in the system goes in that direction. Now, I had already speculated, I mean, if you look at these, these economic issues, then the city, what the city has historically given national economies is centrality you know, intense agglomerations. Now, historically, that centrality was sort of uh, configured in terms of the central city. Today, with the new technologies, with the existence of global electronic markets, centrality does not need to assume only the form of the central city. Centrality can assume different spatial correlates. So I would say that what September 11 does is uh, eliminate in a brutal fashion whatever inertia was down in lower Manhattan. And there was a lot of it. There were a lot of firms down there. Like, I mean, um, uh, Merrill Lynch and Goldman Sachs, two very big ones, had 10,000 employees in lower Manhattan, each of them. That is ridiculous. Lower Manhattan is not about having 10,000 people. They maybe needed 3,000 of those for these very strategic functions. So September 11th is a brutal elimination of the inertia that I think had set in in Wall Street and that sets in in any, you know, I mean, 
there is always a routinizing, and then it becomes inertia to have this concentration. When, when the tasks become routinized, you don't need this concentration. You can disperse. Because now we have two incentives, the one that you meant for dispersal, right? The risks associated with being you know, in, in a high-rise building. The second incentive that is an old one is that it's always more expensive to be downtown than to be out in the field. So my question when I did my research about the global city is why does any firm, especially these firms that have a lot of money that are totally wired up, you know, they can go locate anywhere and have connectivity, why do they stay downtown? It was not, uh, you know, the opposite. That is the question. Why does any of this kind of actor, this economic profit-oriented actor, stay downtown? And so that, and so now there are really two incentives. Now, lo and behold, what's happening? London, and this was passed after September 11, just approved a massive project to build 70 high-rise buildings in central London. Now, Londoners don't like high-rise buildings, and they don't really have a lot of very high-rise buildings. Now they're going to build 70 high-rise buildings. So, so much for the disincentive. By the way, I, I, I must... I don't know if any of you has been in Shanghai recently, but anyhow, in the last five <laughs> years, Shanghai built 3,000 new high-rise buildings. And I found myself doing some sort of interviews in Europe and saying, you know, I mean, we were talking about high-rise buildings and numbers, and I realized when you tell people well, here's a city that built 3,000 high-rise buildings. It is such a vast number that it becomes unreal. It loses, if you want, its Pythagorean, you know, the numbers for the Pythagorean capacity to communicate. You say 70, and it becomes absolutely real. And now I realize that the way to, to talk about this question of high-rise buildings is to say 70 new high-rise buildings in London rather than 3,000 in Shanghai which crosses a threshold where it becomes some sort of floating signifier that doesn't signify anything, you know? So anyhow, but now I have a lot of other things to say about this subject, but, you know, it would really mean... Um, good. All right. Anything? Yes. I actually speak from Canadian perspective. I've lived in Canada for a long time, yes. but I'm also from Croatia. So I'd like to comment, comment rather than ask and then ask yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. perhaps. Um, I saw in Canada, uh, you put the triangle of the multinational, global, uh, the national states losing the power and the cities sort of the possibility of a new mm -hmm. uh, frontier. But in Canada, I want to bring here the role of the United States rather than just the <laughs> yes. multinationals. Yes. Because the loss of power of the Canadian national power was really very much related to the relation to the United States and the free trade agreement of the of Americas. Yes. And we have lost both so sovereignty there, practically, with the sovereign uh, uh, decisions in terms of environmental laws, for example, because now the American companies or the multinationals can sue us Mm -hmm. our own laws mm -hmm. because they lose profit. Mm -hmm. So we gave in and we changed our laws. So the government that is supposed to still be for the common good of the country has been losing the power most to the United, due to the United States and the multinationals. The multinationals, really, the United States makes possible for the multinationals to operate in other countries. Yeah and do what they do. Yeah. And the cities, I would like to comment in Canada, and I hope this example is instructive here, even though the situation is different. But what happened to the cities is that uh, the Toronto gained, the Montreal lost more from separatism than, yeah. than uh, th that was the main reason. But really, the government, <laughs> because they deregulated the social uh, security, and privatized a lot under the pressure of the energy of the really major things, the, they stopped uh, financing and they put the financing on the cities. The city governments are no power. I mean, when you speak of the emerging power, 
the, certainly mm. not on the gover governing level of the cities. They absolutely don't. They are yeah. burdened with financial troubles. Yes, yes, yes. And the people have gone to the streets. You are right, because a lot of immigrants go to the cities where multinationals put some jobs and then they fire them in six months. Yes, yes, yes. So we do have angry people on the streets. We have young people that became active in the cities. But that frontier, the government has gave up the national security of the people, I mean, of the social security, but they never gave up the power to imprison them, to put them on files. Sure. No, Young people yes. are yes. on protest. They are in the tremendous danger. Yeah. I don't see any, actually, at the moment, positive uh, prospects in the near future of the city people of engaging in some really... Uh, for, uh, towards the formal politics. Yeah. They're only protesting and they're really right. uh, it's in a dismal situation. Yeah. So if I may now finally ask the question, uh, we don't have the North, uh, North American Free Trade Agreement here, but how do you see the Croatia, which is not even in European Union, we are still outside, but we are subject to different kind of American multinational combination of being the market just of the dumping right. ground and so on. How would you see us, if you can help us to illuminate that question? Thank you. Well, first let me, I must come back to what you say about no hope and no, you know, when you stand back and you look at it, you can of course say nothing happens. You know, there is no way. Uh, and I just don't. In my research, I have made a point of going digging. I think of myself as a digger and a mapper. I want to dig, go digging into stuff, and discover that which is not totally sort of immediately self-evident, like the powerlessness of the disadvantaged, right? That is the, the immediate experience is the powerlessness of the disadvantaged. Well, I want to go digging, and I want to discover what the possibilities are. And then I think, think actually about this, no formal system of power in our history has been brought down by another equally formalized system of power. All big systems of power have been brought down in very messy and often many internal ways. And think of the Soviet Union Think of the military dictatorships in Latin America. Think of Marcos. You know what? The way we construct history, we never manage to fully map the power of those who lack power, the power of the multitudes. We do not have the categories of analyses to capture this. And that is why even the CIA, which is in charge of monitoring what was happening in the Soviet Union, absolutely fell flat on its face when the Soviet Union came down. The Soviet Union did not come down simply because the United States went in and bombed the hell out of it. We did that in the case of Nazi Germany. You know, the Allies went and bombed Germany out of existence, basically, under the Nazi regime, right? But that's the rarest case. So I think that now, again, what I'm trying to map when I speak about spaces where those who lack power find themselves in a frontier zone with the most powerful actors. And by frontier zone, I mean a zone where there are no rules of engagement, where the engagement is being made, constructed. I, I am simply not willing to fall into the master categories that our historians have produced, where if you have power, you have power. And if you have no power, you have no power. I just don't buy it. And I really think it's also a function of the categories of analysis that we have. So I really think that these amalgamated masses of disadvantaged people, they gain something by being in the space of the city. And theoretically speaking, one might then say that this is one indication of how urban space is productive. You know, you know the whole question of space, space not being just a container, thing, but space as something that produces. I think there is a particular kind of political productivity that the city today has. It doesn't always, as I said, you know, different periods. Uh, Max Weber's burgers had that too. The city today has a particular kind of economic, well, political economic productivity, 
and it has a particular kind of political productivity. And the way I handle this, I've written quite a bit about this, is that the disadvantaged don't gain power in the spaces of these cities. They gain something. I name that something presence, because I don't know what to name it, because it's not power. But I'm really struggling with distinguishing between just powerlessness as a condition where you lack power you know, and something else, where you may not have power, but that is not an absolute condition. Something else happens. So I really think that when we begin to look at micro-histories, and that is why you've got to leave the national state to do these micro-histories, because the, the national state is too formalized. You know, its political enactments are too formalized. But find zones, it doesn't only have to be the city, the city just happens to be a very thick environment, but we've got to develop micro-histories that capture what is going on. Now, I want to come back to a term, multitudes, because I know that you're translating, right, the Empire book. Now, you know, multitude, multitudes, we say multitudes is shorthand for all kinds of things, right? But the category of the multitude is actually an uncritical category. It's a category of the gaze, right? You know what you mean by gaze? Gaze is that you stand and you look at. Saying multitude is an uncritical category, and it is a category of gazing. What I want to do, but I can't do it alone, you understand? I want to enter that thing that we call multitude. We know for a fact that there is a lot of multitude out there in the world, right? That we have a lot of. But I want to enter the multitude, and I want to detect, I want to trace the multiple, micro, informal, political architectures that are also inside that multitude, where lots of things are happening. I was just in Buenos Aires. A terrible situation, right? So I had a formal event. I talked to 1,500 mayors, all these powerless mayors, right? Ah. And then that night, I slipped out of the official. You know, I escaped. And I went with a bunch of people to what are these occupied factories. You know, there are, in Buenos Aires alone, in the city, and I'm talking about the central city, there are, there are over 100 factories that the owners have just left. They've gone broke. The workers have taken them over. They call them fabricas ocupadas, occupied factories. And so we went late at night, 11 o'clock or so, finally I got out of all the official stuff. We drove, we get to a very desolate part of the city, and people had told me, you're crazy, you can't go there, it's dangerous, etc. And I was thinking, look, I'm at Chicago, at the University of Chicago, which is in the biggest ghetto <laughs> of the United States, where there are five murders every night. I think I'll be fine, you know, in these mostly empty, desolate areas in the city. So I did not feel at risk, frankly. But anyhow, so we're in this very desolate area, we turn the corner, and there is, in, in sort of two blocks away, a mass of people on the street, etc. So it was one of these fabricas ocupadas. What was this? Now these are all urban factories. I'm talking about urban, an urban setting, right? Five stories. Three stories were workers making stuff. The workers are not getting any wages. They have simply occupied the factories. There's still the machines are there. The raw materials are there, and they're hoping that they can export because they have, you know, very low prices. Nothing. I mean, you know, it's very cheap. And the other two floors had become community spaces. And there were people cooking together, because there's real hunger now in Buenos Aires, right? And there were, um, and there were people in other floors where people teaching each other music, painting, you know, all kinds of things. Now, these people are poor. This is not going to solve their problem. But there is a subjectivity that is getting produced very invisible, very elusive, and you, you can really not see it. I could have been in Buenos Aires and not have seen this, right? There is this kind of, this is a microcosm of something that is happening all over the world. Will it throw down the United States government? No. But you know what? The United States government is bringing itself down. <laughs> I really think that the way the United States government is proceeding uh, and it's different from the American people, right? So, so I think that there is, in the condition of powerlessness, complex political, multiple, it's not so much complex as multiple political subjectivities, and somewhere suddenly they can kick in, 
And that is when the master historians are totally surprised. All along, that multitude that just looks like a mess actually contains within it all kinds of political projects and all kinds of political subjectivities. So that is why what I see in the space of the city. Now, I have many little tales. To, uh, I can't, you know, we're running out of time here. But I really think that we need to work at this distinction of powerlessness and, you know, something else that may not entail that you have power, but that there is politics happening of some sort, that there are these micro Now, you asked me a question. I'm very quickly going to answer it. Number one, I repeat, I don't know enough about Zagreb to really give, I mean, and, and Croatia, to really give you a reasonable answer. But there are two issues that I would like, and I speak as an outsider, okay? I, in other words, if I were a Croatian, who knows if I would speak this way? But as an outsider, I see that the world is getting to be a very bad place. I mentioned at the beginning, 60 countries are poor. You know, there is a lot of anomie, as we would say in the old days. Uh, I think it's more complex than anomie. Um, I think the United States, as I said in passing, its current government is making sure that the world is a less safe place and the United States is a less safe place. And I really think the United States is sort of beginning to produce the conditions for its own partial disintegration. I think we are had, we're beginning, you no, know, it may take another 10 years before it even becomes legible. But I think, I think we're headed to you know, very, very peculiar period for the US in terms of security. I think the United States government is inviting anarchic terrorism all over the US. I mean, it's just inviting it. Even people who never thought that they might, you know, it's just so, it, it's, its politics are so bad. And its abuse of power through its multinationals, as you say, through the, legis the law it has made, my point about making of law, right? It's absolutely, I think, um, terrible. That's my opinion. Now, looked at that way, I look at Europe as one of the zones in the world, not the only one. I think China is very interesting too, by the way. But as one of the zones in the world where a certain sense of the civic and of international law, etc., remains a very powerful guidance in a way that it does not in the United States. Right? The United States delivers itself of this notion the weak want international law. Those who are strong, i.e. us, we don't need international law. I mean, what kind of a dominant power is that? You know, not even the British Empire spoke like that when they were on top of the world. I mean, it's just brutal. Uh, now, Europe, in other words, is to me very important as a zone that can still enact a certain type of political, legal, civic project. I hence believe that enlargement is very important. I believe that the more of the Central European countries that can become part of Europe, the better. But I'm thinking that project. I'm not thinking market. I'm not, I'll come to that too. I'm thinking about something where you have a collectivity of very diverse components, because that's also important, that they are not all the same, that they are all so different, being able to be internationalists, you know, and to respect international law, to think it through, to work at it, to know that there's got to be some distributive effect. You cannot be like the United States has been with Canada and with, with Mexico. You know, everything for you, for yourself. No, you can't. And Europe has a much more of that possibility than the US has. So I think enlargement from that perspective, again, I repeat, political, legal, civic project is enormously important. Now, at the heart of your question was the notion, is this going to be like the free trade was for Canada, which has been disastrous. I completely agree with you, completely. I don't know. But it seems to me that the kind of brutal legitimating of profit above all else that you see in the political economy that is the US, you don't have that to such an extreme in Europe. You have it a bit, because I can assure you the multinationals in Europe are pretty brutal too. 
But I'll tell you one thing, which is an indicator. United States corporations in Europe have better environmental labor and general civic uh, conduct than they do when they go to Canada, to Mexico, to Brazil. There is, that tells me that there is something about Europe, a sufficiently thick environment, that pushes even these corporations, these United States corporations, to conduct themselves just a bit better. Now, that, that is information, if you want. That's also perhaps a little promise. So the notion is that an enlarged Europe is still a more benign zone from the perspective of these economic issues than is the free trade zone of the United States. And that we should keep that as a datum, you know, as something that illuminates. So it's not simply going to be like the free trade. Because if it were like that, I would say, you're better off staying out. Now, I was in Slovenia two weeks ago. And there the issue is that they will join, right? They will become part. They are part of the perimeter. And guess what? They then have to execute the job of policemen controlling the borders for, quote, unwanted immigrants. Now, when I was there... I said, you know, I would not take that. I would say that the regulating of immigration flows needs to be embedded in the whole of Europe. There is no reason why the French or the Germans or the English should not be part of that regulatory task. And this elementary notion that it's the geographic perimeter where the work of policing has to happen, no. You know, I mean, there are, uh, there's a whole other discourse. But so what I'm, the reason I mention that is I say that participation in an enlarged union has to be thought of in a very deep sense. It's an institutional incorporation. It's not just that you are somehow there at the edge, at the perimeter, you know, the periphery, if you want, that you are then hit by, you know, it's, it's got to be a much more diffuse, institutionally speaking, set of rights and obligations of all the participants. So anyhow, that is what, what, what I would say. So it, it is different from the free trade. Well, I think we are there, no? We've done it. <laughs> uh, I have to ask this one question, yes. uh, because what we said so far, it seems to me very obvious. First, I will ask the question about the, the phenomenon of security uh, we are of, of in, the, in the big cities, which then brings the topic of surveillance. Then you mentioned then your prediction... Oh. Your prediction that you that there there is, there is probably going to happen a trend in the big cities of ratification of the of the centers uh, of the of the dislocation of certain central activities, and then you mentioned this beautiful example uh, in uh, Buenos Aires. So my question would be about the new topic of public space that uh -huh. actually is happening yes. and and when when it's happening because it's obvious that the old typologies are vanishing and that we have a liquid new type of public example this here is a new type of public 10 hour public space which is possible because the movie industry in Croatia went you know we all, we, we, we all know where so I want to uh, hear your prediction about the yeah, yeah. public space uh, we, we talked today during the lunch about our project about public spaces right. so Maybe you can okay, refer I to have, that. I have just two very important issues. I don't want to give you a, a comprehensive review because I think the subject is edgy. There is no such thing as a smooth, you know, there is ba 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 ba. There's no taxonomy here. There's no room for taxonomy. But two points. One, and I, I, I gave a talk recently in London about this. You know, London is a, is a city that is... Uh, battling. There are many battles going on around questions of public space, mostly in the form of anti-gentrification issues and then and immigration and asylum, all of that. And so I find myself saying the following, since now I'm not going to give you a lecture, but just a short answer, right? And that is that a lot of what used to be public space in large, complex cities is today political space. And that is different from public. It is contested space. Something is happening that is a form of engagement. So it ha political is also partly public. 
but we need to distinguish it from public, right? Because public signals participation. Political signals contestation as well as participation. So I think that what we're going now through a phase where we have lost political uh, public space to it becoming more political space. That's one point. Second point, very, very important, and I know that there are some people who are beginning to work on this, and that is the question of the terrain vague, no? underutilized space, abandoned space, space that is no long, that has lost its utility, uh, that of which there is a lot in big cities. Now, this to me is a very interesting kind of space. And, and there are many different levels at which to capture this. One level is, it's there, underutilized. How can you transform it? To what extent is that in embryo public space? Because there are no massive claims. If there are massive claims, it becomes political space. If it's unclaimed, forgotten, people don't even know that it exists, then it becomes embryonic public space. But it's, to be public space, it needs to be constituted. But the other thing about this terrain vague, and I'm thinking of Ignacio Soli Morales, who is an architect, is that many people in these cities that I am describing, you know, often can identify precisely with those abandoned, underutilized spaces, because they feel excluded from the urban glamour zone, and they don't want to be in the urban war zone, the ghetto zone, etc., right? And so it is precisely those abandoned spaces where they can experience themselves as parts of the city. So that which is for person A or gazer, you know, gaze A, abandoned space, is for person B a space that is chock full of meaning, or if not chock full, that has meaning. And Ignacio Soli Morales, I don't know how many of you know his work, he has a beautiful essay on this. You know? So I think that on this question of public space, those are two very important issues for me. But it definitely, both of them signal that the category public space is totally destabilized. My husband, Richard Stennett, used to write about <laughs> public space. I mean, the kind of public space that he writes about that he wrote about, you know, he no longer, he and I wrote about a different kind of public space. It's just no longer a kind of public space that we have. It's just not, nor is it a desired space today, you know. So it's a public space is a profoundly destabilized category. It is edgy, and I find that interesting. And in that edginess, then, I locate these two points, which are just two sites in a very complex map, you know. <laughs> All right. Maybe with this we could wrap it up for this evening. Uh, for this evening, we'll wrap it up. <laughs> uh, First of all, I would like to thank our guest this evening, uh, Saskia Sassen, uh, and also on, on the behalf of organizers, Multimedia Institute, its theory department, Pass Forward, and uh, 3D journal, Capital in Space, uh, of Platforma 981. I would like to thank you as well for showing up and I uh, hope that we'll meet together soon. And I just have this small announcement to make. Soon we'll be, M Multimedia Institute will be bringing out a book by uh, Saskia Sassen that is a translation of four essays by Saskia Sassen. So you'll be informed in time and you'll be in able Croatia. to. In Croatian, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.